Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Pacific Historic Parks History Talks. I'm Amy, the Education and Interpretation Program and Volunteer Coordinator for Pacific Historic Parks. We are a nonprofit organization who works in partnership with the National Park Service. Together, we support Pearl Harbor National Memorial in Hawaii, home of the USS Arizona Memorial, Warren the Pacific National Historical Park in Guam, American Memorial Park in Saipan, Kalau Papa National Historical Park in Molokai, and Diamond Head State Monument in Hawaii. Our mission is to remember, honor, and understand World War II in the Pacific. Through education and interpretive programs, we strive to perpetuate the memory of historical events and honor the people that were involved. History Talks is an interactive series designed to share the history and stories of Pearl Harbor and World War II in the Pacific. History Talks series was designed for students, educators, the general audience, and organizations from across the world to provide live interaction during these uncertain times. Today, we are honored to have guest speaker, National Park Service curator, Scott Pulowski, who will provide us a tour of the, <coughs> excuse me, the Pearl Harbor National Memorial Museum storage collection. He will share with you chosen artifacts that help tell the story of December 7th and the Pacific War. Scott, when you're ready, I'm gonna spotlight you right now. Excellent, uh, thank you. Can you hear me uh, all right? Let me see, yes. Excellent. Uh, thank you, um, and uh, welcome to everybody for uh, putting up with uh, me for a few minutes here. Uh, just a quick, uh, what we're going to be going over today uh, is first, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the National Park Service uh, Museum Program and, uh, and the uh, importance of its mission. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about the uh, collection storage facility that you see here, unfortunately, museum uh, facilities are not uh, um, exciting uh, by any measure. Uh, so hopefully we can make it interesting, uh, if not uh, uh, exhilarating. And then uh, lastly, we'll, or not lastly, but uh, we'll show you uh, a selection of five, maybe six, depending on how quickly uh, uh, the whole tour goes. Um, uh, of specific artifacts up close and personal. The, I believe there's a link shared with you all uh, that has uh, a 360 tour of our main museum uh, storage uh, facility uh, here in uh, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Uh, feel free to take a look at that. Um, I'm standing in uh, the very first room uh, and then there's three other rooms, uh, three or four other rooms uh, around. Uh, also uh, with me, uh, Amanda uh, Thompson, uh, who works with uh, Pacific Historic Parks, will also be um, uh, answering questions and uh, keeping me on track, uh, as well as adding context. Uh, she's uh, uh, a former employee here at uh, Pearl Harbor, and works uh, with Thompson Consulting, um, historical consulting. So, and with that, um, and for anybody who doesn't know, I'm the curator. I've been here for 15 years uh, or so. Uh, I was brought in originally to build the new visitor center and museum uh, storage facility. Uh, and I had at the time every intention of uh, not staying. I ended up uh, staying for 15 years uh, and um, uh, so uh, you're stuck with me for a little while at least. All right, so uh, the uh, National Park Service uh, has uh, over 400 uh, independent units uh, throughout the Park Service. Here uh, on the island of Oahu, we have two uh, National Park Service sites, uh, Pearl Harbor National His uh, Historic uh, National, I'm sorry, uh, Pearl Harbor National Memorial. We've changed our name about a dozen times since I started here. It's hard to keep track. Uh, and then Hon uh, Honolulu uh, National uh, Historic Site. Uh, the bulk of our collections, however, will be in just talking about uh, Pearl Harbor today. Uh, the Park Service mission uh, is to preserve and protect uh, scenery, nature, 
culture, uh, things that are vitally important uh, to our nation for any number of different reasons. And one of the ways that they do, do this is through museum collections. Uh, we have uh, the second largest uh, museum collection in the United States uh, collectively uh, after uh, the Smithsonian. And though my collection here or the Pearl Harbor uh, uh, collection here uh, is only about 67,000 artifacts uh, or so with uh, roughly about 20,000 photographs. Um, the museum program here was authorized in 1958 when uh, the memorial was actually um, authorized by Congress and signed by the president uh, to create uh, both a memorial and a museum to uh, honor and remember uh, December 7th. We since moved uh, along that path that happens uh, uh, with time and that we've added other memorials uh, that are in Pearl Harbor uh, related to the Pacific War, uh, which would include the USS Utah and the USS Oklahoma memorials. And then we also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, also manage uh, Honolulu National Historic Site. Um, uh, because of this change in our congressional and presidential mandates, we've also had to change the scope of collection of our museums so we can tell a broader, more diverse story. Uh, so if you're gonna uh, talk about the Pacific War, you need to have um, you know, items that illustrate the experience of civilians, of um, say the Marine Corps uh, and the Navy because they're all different and they tell a rich uh, story. And similarly, we went from a museum exhibition hall that focused just on the USS Arizona uh, story in December 7th story uh, to what we have now, which is a little larger um, and I would imagine it's going to continue to grow into the entire Pacific War story. Uh, as I said, we've got about 67,000 objects, 20,000 uh, photographs, uh, and it's all stored in uh, about 2,500 square feet of uh, storage space uh, that the Navy graciously donates uh, to, uh, to us and allows us to utilize. Um, other than that, uh, why don't I uh, start showing you around a little bit? Any questions at this point? All right, so uh, as I mentioned, we're in our, uh, in that first, um, uh, first storage room, if you're following along in the 360 uh, tour, these are typical museum storage cabinets. Um, as you can see uh, here, this is just a typical, um, and Amy, if I could, or uh, Amanda, if one of you could tell me uh, if I'm moving around too much or whatnot, if I can improve the look, please do. Uh, this is a typical. Uh, Scott, you're doing good. It's fine. Great. Thank you. Um, the typical uh, cabinet storage that we have. Uh, you can see, you know, these are um, kind of fun little ephemera. Uh, and um, memorabilia from World War II uh, era, uh, even uh, pieces of uh, the USS Arizona's uh, galley deck right there. Um, and within all these fun items, um, you can see we also have commemorative items. I did want to show this particular one, a key from, I believe that's the uh, USSCU, or no, no, that's an Arizona key, I'm sorry. Uh, but I did want to show you this object. Um, this is kind of a fun uh, piece. 
you can see that it says Admiral uh, Pantry. And uh, if you can imagine this mounted on the wall of the ship and a button that sits right there that uh, the Admiral would press to um, uh, call uh, for food and service and whatnot in his uh, quarters in uh, officer's country. What's interesting about this is, uh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago or so, a gentleman uh, called us up and said uh, um, that he had this piece of Arizona that he had found uh, on Fort Island, uh, which is directly adjacent to Battleship Row where the Arizona was moored and uh, detonated on December 7th, and uh, that he wanted to make sure that it was uh, in a museum. And so he sent us pictures, which is part of the donation process. And we weren't entirely sure, uh, you know, it could have been any ship, uh, um, you know, uh, for that matter, it could have been something other than a ship. And um, so we start, uh, so what's frequent, what frequently happens in museums is we had to uh, study it and uh, find out what its history was. Uh, and we were able to, through his story, uh, matching it with, uh, not quite a sister ship, but certainly a um, uh, ship that's close uh, in uh, relations to the Arizona, the USS Texas. Uh, we were able to find the, um, uh, both an analog of this uh, pantry button as well as a specification for it uh, for, um, for the Arizona. So, uh, so this next um, object um, is a, a piece of a dive bomber, a uh, Japanese dive bomber that was shot down on December 7th, winged over Pearl Harbor. This is, uh, uh, I believe, uh, Commander Goto's uh, plane, if I remember right. Um, and uh, as the plane was uh, trying to get away from Pearl Harbor and back to the, the fleet, uh, it ended up crashing right off, uh, right off Barber's Point Lighthouse about a mile or two. Uh, and the pilots and uh, co-pilot uh, parachuted uh, down onto uh, Oahu. Uh, they eventually killed the, uh, um, the two Japanese uh, flyers uh, uh, on de December 7th and 8th. And, um, but they didn't salvage this uh, piece of um, uh, this metal or the, this plane at all until, uh, and then in 1992, um, Hurricane Aniki came to Japan, or I'm sorry, came to Hawaii. Oops, sorry, uh, we're having trouble here, uh, and washed this ashore. And um, it was eventually donated to us by the person who found it on the beach. You, we know it's Japanese. Um, it's, I don't know if you guys can see that at the end of my finger, and I'm sorry. Uh, there's a uh, cartouche in Japanese uh, that is basically a serial number uh, for this uh, particular plane. So we're quite confident, in fact, that it is the plane. And, that, and the point in bringing this up is that research within the national parks or museums i should say um have a, a very strong research component to them that are used to ensure that um uh, that we know something about uh the history that we're displaying that we know that it's an authentic piece that we know that this item um uh, speaks to whatever resource we happen to be dealing with. If you're in Yellowstone, for instance, you know, you worry about wolves and geysers and uh, that kind of stuff, uh, as well as history. Um, but here we worry about World War II, and so we look at uh, authentication and uh, um, essentially uh, how the object uh, came into our hands. Um, and it's a vital part of museum work is to uh, continue to conduct history and whatnot. Uh, I'm sorry, conduct research along the way. 
All right. Um, so this is uh, another uh, museum cabinet. Uh, we call these uh, visual storage cabinets for those of you who want to be a, a museum curator someday. Um, and uh, um, you can see, um, yeah, let's see if I can get the camera up there. Uh, these are uh, pieces of silver um, off of uh, the various ships in that were sunk on December 7th. The one far on the left that's dark there with the little handle sticking out is a bedpan from uh, USS Utah. The silver cups uh, right there on the left are from the Arizona, but were taken off um, the ship before December 7th. And these other uh, tarnished pieces were actually recovered from the ships. Uh, so you can always tell, um, I shouldn't say always, but uh, within our collection, we have pieces that are that we leave unpolished uh, because they are um, uh, salvaged from the ship, and then others that were donated to us um, through a whole process, through a donation process, and uh, we keep the patina and the uh, original uh, condition as as raw as possible. Um, you can see this is just some fun stuff. This is an example, uh, and this is a tough, uh, um, tough object to see uh, in the light. This is a uh, serving tray um, that uh, was salvaged and found in um, Pearl Harbor in the uh, Arizona right after uh, December 7th. Uh, by a gentleman by the name of uh, Lester Ritchie. I think that looks like it might be reversed on your, um, does this make, eh, whatever, we'll keep going. Um, uh, and what's interesting about this is that, uh, so after the attack, you have uh, uh, basically the Pacific fleet on the bottom of Pearl Harbor and, um, you know, they start salvaging uh, for objects uh, that they need immediately. And uh, because they thought uh, uh, an additional Japanese attack would be happening, uh, that meant gunpowder, uh, projectiles, uh, barrels for guns, and, um, and then also, you know, emergent, or not emergency, but uh, uh, vital documents um, that help with, you know, uh, sailors, uh, um, personnel records and pay stubs and that kind of stuff. Um, but the problem with being a diver in Pearl Harbor is that it's very, very uh, dark and um, uh, hard to see. Visibility is frequently um, down to almost zero. Uh, and then you can imagine there's still, for three months after, uh, there's oil leaking onto the, onto the surface and um, uh, and making it darker even more. And so the only thing that the divers could see uh, were shiny things like silver. And so they would keep bringing up um, silver uh, that they found, say, in the Admiral's uh, uh, cabins. And the uh, OICs uh, kept saying essentially, you know, no, we don't want uh, the silver, we want you know, guns, ammunition, that kind of stuff. Uh, and um, so they ended up keeping it. And this guy in particular, Mr. Ritchie, <clears throat> excuse me, knew, you know, the importance of um, uh, what he, the point in history that he was part of. And you can see in this corner, um, that actually says uh, divers on it, and it lists all the divers uh, that were working that day. Uh, and then um, in the middle here, and again, sorry if I'm, there it is. Um, uh, the, these are all the uh, OICs, officers in charge, uh, that he scratched into the, um, into the metal. And then the divers are never alone underwater. They always have a tender uh, on the surface. And he also um, included that. Uh, and then interestingly, I don't know if you can see this, um, 
this is Velcro, uh, and then he also drilled a couple holes in it uh, to mount on his uh, man cave in, I believe, Wisconsin, Minnesota or Wisconsin. And um, he uh, kept it there until he was ready to retire, and then he uh, pulled it down and gave it to us, uh, along with the story behind it, which was fabulous. Um, you'll also notice, uh, as I mentioned, we leave patina on. Um, that uh, This uh, black is actually uh, oil from the Arizona uh, on December 7th. Um, so you can imagine, you know, the value of having that information uh, that we know that this piece uh, came from the ship on December 7th. And um, uh, came from the ship on December seventh, and it's uh, obviously we can trace it back uh, as well. Um, the The main point with the with that object and the next two uh, is primarily that December seventh is a point in time where it essentially changed the course of history uh, for the United States. Uh, um, the 20th and a lot of the 21st century uh, was defined by uh, what happened uh, in the ensuing uh, years uh, during the war and, uh, actually, and during the Cold War and the peace after that. Um, and some people, um, uh, understood it at the time and others uh, and acted on it and others didn't um, and it, you know it was just one of those things where it brings out um, a lot of different emotions and ideas and um, you know things that happen <clears throat> excuse me uh, that happened to people uh, along the way and uh, and again these art objects help tell that story you know about how important it was to them you could see uh, Mr. Ritchie um, was smart enough to um, a keep it as a centerpiece of his life, uh, and then also the people that he shared that moment with, and of course the uh, the, the day that it happened. Uh, we have other objects. Um, this is another uh, visual storage cabinet, um, and again, sorry if I'm shaking uh, too much. Um, that uh, we have a lot of different uh, commemorative uh, pieces. Um, something like this, uh, which is a um, piece of the Arizona, the Oklahoma, uh, and the Utah that has been essentially fashioned together in a, um, sorry, let me get that up. Um, fashioned together in a desk piece that uh, sat on a uh, commander's desk for his 25 years in the military and then donated to us uh, later. Um, we have, uh, and I'll show you these in a minute, uh, these submarines, uh, which are kind of fun. Um, and uh, those are really, I guess, the commemorative pieces. Uh, more silver off the ships. Um, obviously, uh, metals last longer underwater. Um, <clears throat> and then down here, uh, we also have a hot hat box. Uh, it's a wonderful story um, uh, that's well worth learning more about. Uh, basically, um, this gentleman uh, died before he was able to marry the love of his, of his life uh, in a plane that was shot down over, uh, uh, over Pearl Harbor on December 7th. Um, but let me get uh, these uh, two objects down really quick. I'm going to have to put the camera down for a minute and uh, then pull this stuff down. Um, one thing to, uh, one of the uh, topics that I was definitely hoping to cover today um, is essentially the question that we get from people is why do we choose um, certain objects to uh, display 
in our uh, museum for the, the, the public can see. And, um, you know, what's the choices between displaying them and then or keeping them in, uh, uh, in our uh, storage facility where it's difficult for people to, um, uh, to enjoy and you end up being online like, uh, like you are today. Um, and, and basically uh, what it comes down to is a, a number of things. One is that, uh, as I mentioned before, we're trying to tell uh, a particular story that's um, uh, given to us by uh, Congress and the president. And um, we only have so much space, time and money uh, to tell stories. So we have to find you know, what's, ob what's the object that is the coolest and that makes the, s the story uh, come together the best. And I'm sorry, that's not um, uh, in focus, or I'm trying to get it in focus. Uh, so we have, you know, time and money issues, um, and also just sheer numbers. We only display about 275 objects total in our museum uh, that's open to the public, and yet we uh, own about 67,000 uh, items. And there's not enough time in the day for people to see 60, um, uh, 67,000 uh, objects. Uh, this is fun. Uh, this is a fun uh, object uh, because it talks a little bit about commemoration, a little bit about the war, uh, basically, this is a um, piece of lead that um, that uh, came from uh, a midget submarine that attacked on December seventh. Uh, but unfortunately, the captain of the vessel uh, got lost, and he ended up uh, beaching himself uh, uh, completely on the other side of the island. Uh, at a place called, um, uh, well, Waimanalo, uh, and uh, over by Bellows Beach. And the submarine was pulled ashore and then taken apart for intelligence uh, reasons to find out, you know, what was going on. They were obviously at war. Uh, the, the pilot, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, captain uh, was uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of Sakamaki who uh, became our first um, uh, POW in the war. And um, uh, at any rate, uh, so they pulled the, um, uh, the submarine apart um, and then they and looked at it and took pictures and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then they uh, shipped it back to the mainland and used it as war bond, uh, as part of the war bond drive, which basically, you know, was something along the theme of um, look at what they have. We need to arm our uh, soldiers uh, appropriately. Uh, please buy war bonds. One of the um, enterprising young sailors uh, took a piece of, uh, of lead uh, that was used as the ballast because they didn't want to ship lead back to the United States. Um, and the submarine is already heavy enough and doesn't make sense. And he actually made a set of 50 of these sub, uh, submarines, is my understanding, uh, of which they were sold as kind of the premium um, uh, premium offering, if you will, uh, for the uh, war bond drive. Um, subsequently, and I didn't pull it down, uh, one of the other submarines were uh, was found in um, uh, where are you guys seeing it? Uh, in 1960, uh, and uh, somebody did a commemorative piece of similar style, um, which is, I don't know, I, I love, love that, that story myself. Most of what you're seeing today is about things that I just enjoy the story of, um, and that most people don't get to see. Um, so there's that type of uh, commemoration. And there's also, uh, for uh, what everybody uh, 
may be aware of or not, um, there's uh, fraternal organizations and um, uh, fraternal organizations as well as uh, su uh, survivors groups as well as nonprofits and just interested people who come together and try to remember um, both December 7th and the uh, Pacific War. One of the big uh, groups is uh, Pearl Harbor Survivors Association, uh, which uh, is what that um, uh, little seal there is. And this is uh, from the 30th anniversary uh, of um, December 7th, where they needed to raise funds. And so they worked with um, uh, Jim Beam, uh, as you can see, and uh, made this um, decanter or bottle. And um, this is a top with a cork on it. Uh, and Great Eagle, turn it around. Uh, and filled it up with Jim Beam and sold them as a, a fundraiser, uh, which is a lot of fun. And you can still find these on occasion in um, on eBay. And what's again, what's interesting about this uh, is, you know, here are people who, uh, and if you'll pardon me, I'm going to put this back as I'm talking. Who wanted to, whose mission is to remember Pearl Harbor and to stay vigilant, uh, and uh, they needed, uh, they did it by um, essentially subscription uh, uh, through dues and through the um, uh, bottle uh, being made and sold to fundraise so they could continue their operations. Uh, and then, uh, all right, so, and then now the last item, or last two items, I guess, if we're still on time, which I think we are, um, we have, and as I mentioned, uh, um, that we try to tell a diverse story of different, uh, ship, so it's not all just the Arizona. Um, uh, one of those stories that's uh, pretty gruesome is this: uh, is the USS uh, Oklahoma that uh, turned over with uh, a number of sailors uh, um, caught inside. Uh, this uh, particular photo album is uh, pretty special. This is from uh, Walter Staff. Uh, he was, uh, I believe, the last rescued. Uh, sailor uh, off the Oklahoma um, or something along those lines uh, and um, if you're interested more about his story uh, which is pretty harrowing uh, eventually Pacific Historic Parks will have uh, oral histories uh, of um, many of the participants uh, of December 7th uh, posted on their website they have I believe three now but um, uh, the goal is to have uh, uh, a lot of them that both they have conducted and then also what uh, um, the National Park Service has conducted over the years. We hold about 775 uh, oral histories in total. Um, and if you'll... Pardon me for a moment, I need to take this out of its box before we turn some pages in. I'm going to just walk through and uh, show some, I've got some pages set aside uh, so we can look at it relatively easily without uh, too much aggravation. Um, so these photo albums are fun. Uh, as I mentioned, or maybe I haven't mentioned this yet, but um, you know, this is uh, Facebook and um, Instagram and all the other social media things that are out there uh, of its day. Uh, and for those of you who didn't know, and I, I didn't learn this until uh, a couple years ago uh, with my uh, grandmother, is that in the 30s uh, in particular, there was a, um, a trend. Uh, uh, you had to be stylish and hot. Uh, you had to have um, a signature uh, book of all your friends. 
Uh, and so people would literally walk around with um, uh, these um, autograph books. And you can see here that uh, they, ha um, they have a little bit of that uh, period on these, um, on the first couple of pages of this photo album. As you can imagine, um, these photo albums uh, were vital memories of uh, what um, uh, people experienced uh, during their time in the military. Um, things like uh, crossing the equator. Uh, we, I might have some photographs um, of this, uh, but a very important um, uh, point where uh, in a sailor's uh, career is where they crossed. And you can see uh, in this case, Mr. Staff um, uh, crossed in the USS Medusa uh, in the New uh, Hebrides uh, Islands in 43. So uh, up until December 7th, uh, he, he was uh, uh, still what's called, I believe, a polywog. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, one of the first things that commanding officers would require their um, sailors and soldiers to do is, um, and that's not coming in very well, is to actually go down and, uh, well, first it was to write their parents and tell them that, and their families, and tell them that everything was okay. And then second, uh, it was to uh, go down um, to the local stores and buy a keepsake. And so a lot of people bought these uh, uh, photo albums. Uh, you can see all the hand paintings done on the, on the front covers. And, um, uh, and they would fill them up, uh, you know, like what people do today with their uh, photographs. Um, you know, this is showing um, Mr. Staff's experiences in Hawaii and um, back earlier, that was actually Vancouver, uh, uh, British Columbia, which is kind of a fun little uh, spot for me. Here's some pictures of Waikiki. Um, Sorry if this is not working. Uh, you can see all the sailors enjoying uh, time. Things haven't changed that much on Waikiki Beach. There's uh, uh, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, I believe. And here's some other fun things. Uh, a nice picture of... Uh, although you can't tell on that, uh, life at uh, Hawaii Volcanoes uh, on the Big Island. Uh, for those of you, uh, you may uh, know where that crack actually is located. And of course, sailors doing sailor things. And of course, I believe that is his wife. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but anyway, so we have a lot of these and uh, uh, you'll be able to see these on uh, uh, Pacific Historic Parks website uh, in the near future uh, as well. Are there any questions uh, at all at this point? We're still good, Scott. Scott are you, yeah, are you wanting questions or do you want to oh. go over that letter? You still have time to go over yep. that. Okay. Yep. No, uh, okay. Do and, questions uh, at the end. Yep. All right. Now, the last uh, item is you know, so one can imagine being in, I mean, even today, uh, communications in. Uh, Hawaii is, is not the best. Uh, uh, yeah, we have slow phones and all sorts of issues. Um, but in 1941, it was even worse, right? Uh, telephones were uh, uh, landline. Uh, the radio systems were hadn't been built yet. And so people wrote letters uh, uh, to their loved ones. And um, 
Uh, so a lot of our collection, uh, we have about 200 linear feet of archival material um, uh, that consists of uh, letters home uh, to families. As I mentioned, uh, sailors and soldiers were required to uh, write their families uh, when they first arrived. Um, and then because uh, communications were so terrible, uh, the, probably the best um, uh, best way to um, communicate was uh, with uh, uh, writing. Um, we know that this is a love letter uh, for a number of reasons, um, and unfortunately, uh, you guys are seeing it backwards. Um, but uh, I don't know if you guys can see this red here, uh, but that's lipstick. Uh, um, so, and with that, um, that is, I guess if you're following the uh, three-dimensional uh, or the 360-degree tour, uh, this is the rest of our storage facility. You can see on the right uh, our compact uh, shelving. On the left, more museum cabinets uh, and the visual storage cabinet that's uh, not visible. And then lastly, uh, our uh, cold storage unit uh, that holds our 20,000 objects. Um, uh, and this is kind of our, the rest of our storage space. Um, so with that, that is uh, our uh, museum storage and our uh, uh, collection. Hopefully uh, some of that made sense and I'm op it's open for questions. That was great, Scott. So now I'm going to turn it over to Nick and Nick will um, start filtering the questions to you. Okay, go ahead, Nick. Hello, so my name is Nick. I am part of the PHP Education and Interpretation department uh, and I'm going to facilitate the question. So I'm going to start off with Patricia. Patricia, I'm going to unmute you uh, right now. So if you want to go ahead and ask your question, you're welcome to ask your question to Scott. Thank you, Nick. Can you hear me, Scott? Just fine. Okay, yep. great. Um, the, the, I had actually a two-part question. The, the first part is, um, can you tell us about your uh, educational background? Because I'm assuming that as a curator, you must have a degree in library or archival or museum studies. And then the second part of that is what got you interested in archival, museum, historical uh, preservation? Uh, sure. um, so actually, to, uh, so there are um, uh, degrees that are specialized for museum uh, studies. Uh, interestingly, I, I do not uh, possess one. Um, I uh, hold uh, three different degrees, one in uh, architectural design, one in uh, population biology, uh, and then an uh, MBA, uh, which represents a lot of the component parts of what we deal with in museums, but it's definitely not a uh, specific um, degree. The way I got interested in it and what happened was I actually was volunteering for the Park Service uh, as something, you know, to be part of interesting things and also I needed a um, place to camp. Um, and uh, my job at Dinosaur uh, National Monument was to work with the uh, archives and make them accessible to uh, the public. It was quite interesting and I got to know the museum curator uh, for the region, Laura Joss, who eventually uh, offered uh, me a position. And then uh, through um, uh, on the job training uh, and mentorship, uh, I essentially learned uh, uh, both uh, uh, collections management uh, as well as um, uh, collections management as well as uh, archival and information uh, management. Uh, and then I further worked uh, at the University of Colorado uh, for uh, Dr. Alex Cruz, who was the associate 
uh, curator of ornithology at uh, the University of Colorado uh, Museum of which, so at any rate, I um, ran his lab and uh, did his, um, uh, <laughs> did his uh, hard work um, and uh, uh, learned uh, about natural history collections there. Um, but that's, uh, and then eventually made it uh, here to Pearl Harbor. And how long have you been doing that? Uh, I've been uh, with the Park Service for 24 years. Wow. Uh, uh, here in Pearl Harbor uh, for, I think this is my 16th year. It feels um, like a different number. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a long time. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. It was very informative. Great. All right. Thank you, Patricia. I'm going to go on to the next person. So I have uh, Alexander. Alexander, I'm going to unmute you, right? Ask you to unmute. So if you can go ahead and unmute and go ahead and here's Scott. Um, so I was just wondering, um, how old are most of these items that um, are in this museum that you're showing off? Uh, good question. Um, so we actually have uh, uh, items uh, from about uh, starting about 1900 uh, or so and then uh, carrying clear into modern uh, materials. So, you know, things that we collected, uh, you know, last week or, or well, in this case uh, a couple of months ago. Um, the majority of our collection, however, really falls into between 1935 and 1950 uh, or so. And that represents essentially the build up to uh, the attack on December 7th, obviously uh, December 7th, and then uh, the Pacific War. All right, so I have uh, Matthew next. Uh, Matthew, I'm gonna unmute you right now. Can go ahead and ask your question. Can you hear me? I can now. Oh, there you go. I was wondering about the photo album. Obviously, it was not on board the ship. It was at home or something. Is that how it survived? Uh, you know, I, I actually print. I I would assume so. Um, I don't think we have that information in our at least in our catalog records. Um, but that's uh, typically what uh, transpired. Um, uh, although we do have a couple that were salvaged off of the ship and uh, items that were salvaged off of the ship, but uh, one like this. Um, he might have even sent it home, uh, you know, after right. getting stationed here. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, and, and actually that brings up a, a good point. Um, one of the, uh, in terms of research that we try to do, and um, I didn't fully illustrate it very well on this uh, uh, discussion, though, is we want to know about the object, you know, who owned it and how did it come to, into our possession. Um, and th those types of st uh, stories are vital for us to document the authenticity uh, of these uh, things. And it also tells us a lot about the person, too. All right, so I have Paul next. Paul, I'm gonna ask you to unmute right now. And as soon as you are ready, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, Scott, hi. My question for you is, if I'm not mistaken, when the USS Memorial was built, there, the USS Arizona Memorial was built, there were elements of the superstructure that were removed to make way for the memorial. Whatever happened to all that material that was removed so that the memorial could be built? Uh, it's sitting on um, uh, a piece of uh, uh, ground on the uh, on the Navy base. Um, it's uh, surrounded by a fence uh, to keep uh, people and bulldozers out. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's actually uh, Navy property um, uh, still. Uh, the ship, uh, even well, the the ship, the USS Arizona, uh, is owned by the U.S. Navy, and then 
uh, the National Park Service helps with managing uh, that as a historical resource. And then uh, the USS Memorial, because of our uh, 2008 uh, presidential proclamation, uh, became property of the, United, uh, of the National Park Service. Okay, great, thank you. So Nick has been kind enough to last, let me ask a second question. So here's a second question. Do you, like all the, the like materials that you have in your possession and storage, I mean, are they cataloged in such a way where like another museum, like the World War II Museum in New Orleans or the National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas could ever say, you know what, we're building this exhibit. You have this, can we take that and make it part of our exhibit for a limited period of time? Sure. Um, yeah. So um, the so the Park Service being the second largest uh, uh, museum uh, organization in the United States, um, you know, and and being government uh, takes uh, property ownership very seriously, and we have all sorts of policy and procedures in terms of cataloging it, uh, and then similarly. Uh, uh, we do loan objects out to qualified institutions and um, uh, and what have you. You know, uh, we, I don't think, we don't have anything, uh, I'm trying to think who we have loans out to right now. Uh, we have uh, loans to uh, the Great Lakes Training Center uh, in uh, Illinois. Uh, we have um, uh, stuff loaned to the uh, USS Lexington. Um, uh, museum. Uh, we also have uh, stuff loaned to the uh, Arizona Capitol Museum. So at any rate, it's, it's very common. Uh, there's criteria and whatnot. Um, the, the question of, you know, how good is our data uh, that people might be able to find something, you know, um, uh, is dependable or depends. Uh, I, I think it's pretty good, but um, you, know, you never know. All right, I have a question from Nancy. And uh, Nancy, I'm gonna ask your question because it's a pretty straightforward question. Uh, her question is, isn't the USS Arizona still a commissioned US naval ship? No, it's been, it's been struck from the register. Okay, and then I have a question from Mike. The question, uh, he asked me to read it for him. It says, what artifact for Pearl Harbor means the most to you and why? <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I've got a, I've got a bunch really. Um, th that uh, silver platter with the uh, from uh, Mr. Ritchie is is one of I would say two of my favorite um, or most favorite. Uh, to my mind, uh, it's it's fabulous uh, for a number of reasons about what he did with it, uh, how he stored it, and that he made sure that it was available. Uh, uh, to the rest of us uh, in, in the future. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, uh, I, uh, for almost 15 years, led the uh, dive program here at the USS Arizona uh, Memorial. So I uh, work with a lot of uh, uh, divers. And, and so you know, having an artifact uh, uh, from divers is kind of close to my heart as well. All right, and I'm going to do this one for everyone because a lot of people seem to be asking this question. Is there a catalog that the public can access of all these different artifacts that you have? Uh, no, um, uh, we don't. Uh, well, you can contact me uh, at the park uh, and I can help you find things. Uh, but, um, and it is your data. Uh, the problem is actually disseminating access uh, um, uh, to the collection. Uh, so at any rate, the, the, it is accessible. Contact me by email, uh, which is, uh, I believe, on our website, uh, nps.gov slash P-E-R-L. And uh, I can help you uh, find things and do research as, as needed. And so we're slowly running out of time. So I'm going to actually hand it over to Nanette right now. And again, if those, for those of you who do have additional questions, uh, Nanette can go over how to uh, get in contact. Okay. Can you hear me? 
as we can. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Scott. I am Nanette Kyoto, the Education and Interpretation Coordinator with Pacific Historic Parks. We would like to thank you for joining us today. Scott, it has been a great honor and pleasure to have you on History Talks and giving us a live tour of the Pearl Harbor National Memorial Museum storage collections and these priceless artifacts. In the chat box, we have a link that will connect you to a short survey. This will allow you to share your feedback, suggestions, and any questions that you may have for Scott. Thank you, everyone. I will turn it over to Nick now. All right, thank you, everyone. So again, if you have any additional questions, do please do fill out the form and we will get those questions to Scott as soon as possible. So again, uh, I'm going to allow everyone to unmute themselves. And what I would like is for everyone to go ahead and tell Scott, uh, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Right. Thank you for joining Thank us you, today. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And again, this form is in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>